Welcome everybody to the last day of GoToConf. I don't know about you, but I've been really enjoying a lot of the talks I've heard. And I'm also really grateful that you all came to this talk because the other two options, they looked pretty useful. They taught useful information, whereas I'm not. I'm not gonna teach you anything useful. I'm just here to answer one question, which is, are we really engineers? Or I guess more specifically, should we treat software development as a branch of engineering? Now, the yes answer to this is a pretty easy argument. It says on my business card that I'm a software engineer, I'm a software engineer, okay, great, talk over. <laughs> but what's really interesting is the no answer, because there's two different reasons from very different perspectives of why people say we're not engineers. The first is what I'll call the Gerald Weinberg camp. He says, if builders built houses the way programmers built programs, the first woodpecker to come along would destroy civilization. In contrast to him is what I'll call the Jeff Atwood camp. After his line, software development is only like bridge building. If you're building a bridge on the planet Jupiter out of newly invented materials using construction equipment that didn't exist five years ago. So these are very two different perspectives on why we shouldn't consider software engineering a branch of engineering. One says we don't live up to the standards and the other says what we do is so wholly unique, engineering practices simply couldn't apply to us. Now, I do this thing called formal methods, where you try to mathematically prove code correct. Instead of writing this, you write this. Like many other people in formal methods, I was very, very strongly in the Gerald Weinberg team. I thought that software development wasn't really engineering, and we had to drag ourselves into the 20th century to be gain any kind of respect. Then I read this tweet, trying to compare and contrast the two. This was somebody who was arguing that software has too much implicit knowledge. Too much of our systems is in our heads and not written down. He contrasts it to bridge building, where he says, a building or a bridge will not suffer if its creators left. Others could figure out from plans and inspection and take stewardship. Not so in software. And I look at that tweet and said, that can't be right. Like, can you really figure out an entire bridge from just the blueprint? I mean, I wouldn't know. I've never built a bridge. Wait, has Gerald Weinberg Jeff Atwood built a bridge either? Maybe all of our conceptions about building bridges is entirely in our imagination based on what we've seen in the media. And like, can we trust that? We all know what the media says about software engineering, right? It thinks it looks like this. <laughs> Now, I said I do formal methods, but that's only because I've not yet been able to monetize my true passion, which is falling down rabbit holes. At the time that I read this tweet, I had just come off a two-week bender trying to figure out why calculators have eight digits and not more, and I thought this seemed like a better use of my time. What if instead of just basing our decisions on what engineering looks like off what we think it might look like, we talk to actual engineers? And not just engineers, but engineers who have physical, professional experience in both software and their old field. They are the only people who actually know both fields well enough to say whether or not we are the same or different. So I decided that what I would do is I would find these people, who I called crossovers, and try to figure out three questions. One. Are we really engineers or should we call ourselves something else? Two, how similar is our work to engineering? Is it really like building a bridge on the planet Jupiter out of new materials or is it actually much similar to what everybody else does? And three, is there anything cool I could like turn into a talk that, about how to do software better? As to how I actually found these people, Twitter, I used Twitter. Man, everyone remember when Twitter was good? You know, like before 2022? So in the end, I found 17 crossovers who represented six different disciplines of engineering. I tried to have some redundancy in case somebody had a very myopic view and recorded 12 hours of interviews with them. Everything following this will be based on what they said and the aggregations and curation I did on that material. So let's start with the first and possibly most important question. Are we really engineers? And this is actually the wrong question. Because before we can ask it, 
we have to ask a different question. What's engineering? You see, everybody who was talking about building bridges on the planet Jupiter, they were thinking of civil engineering. Civil engineering is the branch where we build things like bridges, buildings, roads, etc. As one person I talked to put it, everything required for a living city. But civil engineering is only 20% of professional engineers in the United States. The rest are part of a wide variety of other fields, like mechanical, electrical, chemical, and industrial. And once you, realize, once you realize this, what you start to see is that any sort of definition of engineering kind of doesn't work for at least some category of people that are definitely engineers. I'm going to go through three examples of common definitions of the quality of engineering that people say engineering must be to count. These are physical, consequentiality, and licensure. To start with, a lot of people think that engineering must be physical. Therefore, software engineering cannot be engineering because, well, we're not building a thing. To respond to this, I want to bring up one of the industrial engineers I talked to. His last job before he transferred was with Boeing. They had an air traffic control tower that was communicating with flying airplanes, intermediated by a very large antenna array. And his goal was to take all these different systems being built by different teams in different companies and make sure they all played nice with each other. The example he gave was the airport doing something that required the airplane to respond in a way that violated FCC guidelines on which wave bands you could use. And just to make things interesting for him, the antenna array, before any of this was being figured out, the antenna array was already being built. They did not have the time or budget to wait for all these details to be ironed out. So at any point during any of these discussions, the antenna people could be like, well, we already built the system, you have to follow what we do. And he'd have to redo everything he planned around that. So this is an example of a system that, while involves physical components, much like what we do involves computers, isn't quite a physical thing. Incidentally, he did recommend this one book to me that I ended up picking up. The Handbook of Industrial Engineering. I'm not going to read to you very much because it is 3,000 pages, but I just want to point out this one interesting part in the very beginning in the role and scope of industrial engineering. They list seven principles that should be put into practice by all industrial engineers, and I'd like to list two of them. Number one, the uniqueness principle. Each project should be regarded as different from previous seemingly similar projects. The similarity is often illusory or misleading. And principle number six, the people design principle. People who have a stake in a problem must have a role in finding and implementing the solution. Solutions that are imposed on people are erroneous and self-defeating. Does this remind anyone of anything? <laughs> so we can establish that engineering isn't necessarily a physical phenomenon. Now let's move on to consequentiality. This is the idea that engineering must be high stakes. When a computer acts buggy, we just curse and reset. When a engineering system fails, people die. Or at least that's how it's commonly portrayed. First of all, this is a bit not fair to software because a lot of software does have very serious consequences when it fails. In 2014, an integer overflow error in a database blocked out 6,600 calls to 911. Fortunately, according to investigations, nobody died, but it does show the very high stakes that can happen when software fails. But of course, somebody would say, that's the exception. Most software is really dirt cheap and doesn't matter, and it's just not high stakes at all. The thing is, though, same is true with engineering. Like, we often think about engineering as, again, the buildings and bridges, but a lot of things that people engineer are very, very low stakes. Like, this laser pointer. This is the one provided by the um, I go to because mine, the laser pointer just stopped working one day. And I didn't go, oh wow, I'm going to buy now. I was just like, oh wow, this is just a piece of garbage and just continue to use it for other things. One of the um, people I talked to didn't work on this, but had a coworker who did, who spent years of their life making those birthday cards that when you opened them played music. Is that really that consequential? No, but it's still engineering. So, Engineering doesn't need to be consequential to count. The third thing is licensure. And this is probably the thing that takes up the most space in online discussions. 
this idea that engineering must be licensed to count. And because most of us are not licensed, we do not have a professional certification, we do not count as engineers. Unlike the other two, though, this is not an essential characteristic of engineering. It's a political thing. It is true that in Canada and Germany, for example, you can't even call yourself an engineer unless you're licensed. But you can in the United States and China. You cannot call yourself a principal engineer, somebody who can sign off on large-scale projects without a license. But under the principal engineer works many other engineers that don't need to be certified. They don't even need to have a college education. One person in mechanical engineering worked with a high school dropout who he said was just as good as the rest of the team. And in some places, like the UK, not even that's true. While they have a distinction between certified and regular engineers, the only difference is prestige. A regular self-described engineer who doesn't even have an engineering qualification can sign up on large-scale projects. If there's something to the essence of engineering, it probably shouldn't be something that varies from state to state and country to country. So engineering doesn't need to be physical, and it doesn't need to be consequential, and it doesn't need to be licensed. And I can go through some other things that people qualify, but they all have the same problem. Either they include things that are clearly not engineering, or they exclude things that clearly are. In the end, there's only one thing I found that defines what it means to be doing engineering. This isn't actually a joke. Something is engineering if enough people that we agree are engineers say it's engineering. No more, no less. And under this definition, I just gave up and just went to all 17 people and asked them, so, are we engineers? 15 said yes, 2 said no. Congratulations, everybody, we're engineers. <laughs> this was a shock to me. I was expecting everybody to talk about how, no, we didn't live up to those standards, and no, we shouldn't even call ourselves that. So to hear so many people unqualifiedly say, yes, the work I do in my new job is still engineering, it still looks just like my old work, was a huge surprise to me. I had to admit I was completely wrong, and my misconceptions were just like everybody else's. Misconceptions. Now, of course, there is some nuance to this. Most fields have a distinction between the engineering work people do, and what I'll call tradecraft. For every electrical engineer, there's approximately five electricians working in the United States. They're still working in the same domain, often with the same materials, but they're doing different kinds of work from a different knowledge base. And the same probably exists in software, too, as many of the people pointed out. There exist software engineers and some other thing. We don't like to admit this because, unfortunately, in society, there is a very big difference in prestige between this and this. But that's, again, a problem with our society, not between trying to understand the work we do. What is interesting, though, that as many people pointed out, these two fields are much closer in software uh, than they are in the other spaces. One person said that she worked as a software engineer, and then a new project wasn't anymore. She did non-software engineering, but software development. Then the project after that, she went back to being a software engineer. It turns out that people can sort of cross the script much more easily in software as opposed to other spaces for reasons I will get into later. That still leaves us, though, with trying to figure out what this thing is, which is not a thing that has, this is the thing that actually has been discussed a lot. For example, in this book, Software Craftsmanship, The New Imperative by Pete McBrain. As he puts it, writing code is no longer the hard part of development. The hard part is figuring out what to write. This kind of know-how demands a skilled craftsman, not somebody who only knows how to pass a certification course. He defines this idea of the software craftsman being that trade craft thing in contrast to software engineering, which is more proper engineering. Now, I do agree with him that we do need to distinguish these concepts. I disagree with him on almost everything else. The more you read this book, the more you realize that he has a very, very negative view of what engineering means. He thinks of software tradecraft, software craftsmanship, as being all about the unknown, taking explicit and tacit knowledge and embodying it in software, in contrast with regular engineering, which for the record I'm going to call traditional engineering. It doesn't make sense to distinguish real and software if they're both real. 
What he says is that traditional engineering is this like really boring, slow, stale thing, working with predictable materials, with no uncertainty, with no creativity or, or, or dynamic life. But just like everybody else I've talked about, he didn't work as an engineer, as a traditional engineer. He's basing it, once again, off his own conceptions of what it must look like. And that brings me to part two of this talk. How is software different from traditional? Or, uh, flippantly, are we special? We have this conception that software is so wholly unique that traditional, that traditional engineering principles just don't apply to us. The most common way that this is manifested is the idea that Oh yeah, traditional engineers never have to worry about, after they build the bridge, the client saying, hey, I want this move 500 feet to the left. They never have to move the bridge. If I wanted to try to sort of summarize all these different contrasting views of the two spaces, I'd put it like this. Software is agile, where traditional is waterfall, is unpredictable and dynamic, where, it, where traditional is predictable and routine, and is more formal and creative, while traditional is more quantitative and rigorous. Let's go into all three of those things. Starting with the biggest one. Software is agile. According to software folklore, from engineering we got this idea of waterfall, where we have this strict iteration between planning, designing, building, testing, and deploying. Each phase must be completed in full before we move on to the next phase. This, while being great for engineering, was totally unsuited to software. So we just took this idea, invented Agile, and threw it in the trash. So is engineering waterfall? Sorta. So it is true that the civil engineers I talked to did talk about working in this very waterfall way, whereas in the software world, they were much more agile. But that, once again, was the civil engineers. Everybody else I talked to was much more in the middle. Because it turns out this entire distinction between waterfall and agile breaks down to one core metric. How fast can you iterate? The slower you iterate, the more your process looks like waterfall. The faster you can iterate, the more your process looks, looks like agile. And this is true across every field I talk to. And this is because, as we realized, waterfall sucks. Everybody hates it, nobody wants to do it, because unlike agile, it cannot deal with unpredictability. Because this assumption we have that engineering is fundamentally predictable, completely untrue. Like that thing I mentioned about nobody ever has to move a bridge after it's built. There are books on how to move bridges after they're built. It's not a rare thing. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, the only two engineers I talked to who mentioned actually having to do this were not crossovers. So I'll instead use some different anecdotes to really illustrate this. Here are just three of the stories I've heard about just how unpredictable and how wild engineering can look like. The first was from an electrical engineer who had to build a circuit with a microcontroller. They were working with a particular kind of vendor who had a choice of a thousand different microcontrollers that fit. He found a couple that actually worked perfectly for his design and was about to supply them when he discovered that this supplier would only supply them in quantities of 5,000 more. Turns out there were only 250 he'd get in smaller quantities. Okay, some of these chips worked, some didn't. He found ones that mostly worked with some minor changes. And then he found out that of all of these, they were out of stock and would only be back in stock in a couple of years. For the ones that actually could work almost, there were only eight choices, and all of them would require some significant changes to his entire plan. In the end, he picked one of the circuits that he realized he recognized the shape of and therefore knew he could solder it easily and make changes around it. So he bought those circuits, he bought those microcontrollers, and just redesigned his whole circuit. Incidentally, I thought it would be fun for this um, talk to do some CSS animations. There are seven different ways of embedding an SVG in HTML, and all of them have wildly different constraints in how you can animate them. Okay, example two. Somebody who worked on an oil rig, doing essentially um, verifying the vibrations to see if it was safe for people to live on them. At one point, and oil rigs have a lot of like freestanding structures, and at one point you need to get a bunch of new equipment, a sensor array, into one of these structures. The problem was that it was four inches too tall for any of the floors. The only thing they could do was just go in and step one, saw out a square foot of the floor, then move the sensor in, and then build a tiny platform over that and just slap a warning sign saying, don't trip over this. <laughs> like 
the software, traditional engineering has lots of clutches and hacks and technical debt. Unlike software engineering, you never get a chance to fix that. That oil rig is still there and still has that warning sign. Okay, last example. This one's my favorite, personally. This was a person who was a mining engineer and worked at a mining site that they were building. This was in a very, was in a swamp with lots of wet, nasty peat bog. And they had to excavate most of it before they could start their actual mining work. So they had to excavate all this peat, load into trucks, and ship it off to a storage facility. And they did this for a couple of weeks until one day just all the trucks came back. Turns out, for some reason that he didn't go into, into it, that storage site could no longer be used to store all this peat bog. And the only place they could store it was the camp itself. So they had this night sneak camp they had to tear down and build around this giant mound of 100,000 cubic meters of wet peat bog. Don't you just hate it when like, you have one requirement that comes in halfway through development that changes everything about your product around it? Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. So we can see that engineering can be just as unpredictable and just as um, dynamic as software, where you have new challenges come up that change your entire approach. And for this reason, people really, really spend a lot of time looking for ways to make their projects faster, more agile, more iterative. The same mining engineer discussed what he called the new Austrian tunneling method, which is a way of drilling tunnels in a very agile, lean way. So when people say that Agile had its roots in the 1990s with extreme programming, you could be a huge pet and just tell them, no, it has its roots in the 1950s with the Viennese tunneling, Austrian tunneling method. Don't do that, that's rude. The most common way that people actually iterate, make their iterations faster is through the use of software. This is a finite element analysis diagram where people use software to simulate um, the loads on a physical structure. This helps them find the weak points without going through the whole iteration cycle of actually building and seeing where it's weak. Software plays a huge role in making these fields more agile. Which brings me to my third point. Engineering is more rigorous. And like the original thing about engineering being more waterfall, this is sort of true. Engineers spend a lot more time in traditional fields with trying to like work out the flaws in their stuff before they actually build it. But once again, this comes down to iteration factors. When iteration times are very long and expensive, you want to work out the kinks as early as possible. If you get the ability to iterate faster, all of these fields start to get a lot less rigorous. They start to just do things and see what happens. One example comes from a chemical engineer who was involved in manufacturing rubber. Rubber is a very difficult um, thing to synthesize, as he told me, and a lot of the reactions happen at negative 20 degrees centigrade, which is why when suddenly in the entire plant the reaction just stopped working, they really didn't want to investigate why it stopped working. So they decided before they try to like seriously go down and investigate what part of the product just was having this serious flaw, they just shut down the entire plant and turn it back on again and hope that fixed it. It did. Yeah. More often though, the way that people will try to shorten their iteration times is through the use of software fixes. A, um, one engineer told me who worked on hardware said that their, that their um, company had shifted at that point about a thousand different electronics devices, of which exactly zero of them, according to a chart they had published in like a public area in the company, did not have a last minute software fix. The hardware had some issue and they realized, hey, we could just tell the software engineers, fix this in the firmware after we ship. A lot cheaper, a lot sloppier, but it got the job done. I mean, most of the time it gets the job done because this can actually have some very tragic consequences. Who here remembers the 737 max crashes? At the time, this was attributed to a software defect in the MCAS system, which is part of the flight control. And it was often used as a sign of how sloppy software engineering can be. What was only discovered on later investigation, though, was that this wasn't just a software issue. These are called the nacelles of the um, aircraft, these things that come down. And when the Boeing engineers were making the 737 MAX, they discovered in the late iteration that making these so much larger than the older versions of the 737 made the plane aerodynamically unstable when doing dives. But they decided that trying to fix this flaw and redesigning the aerodynamic profile of the plane would just be too expensive. So they told the software engineers, hey, make an MCAS system that like, fixes this in the software. Then that software had a bug and 350 people died. 
So this idea that engineering is much more rigorous than software, unfortunately, not always true. So on that note, let's just say that this view that we have of the differences between the two spaces doesn't look like this. It looks more like this. Both of them are highly iterative. Both of them are highly unpredictable. And while traditional is more formal than software, it's not necessarily always more formal. But there are also some differences. One that's come up implicitly a while now is velocity. When I talk about iteration cycles, the engineers say that they're trying to shorten those iteration cycles, meaning that they want to get it from weeks down to days or days down to hours. Whereas in software, people often tell you that if it takes a minute to run all your tests, you're doing something deeply wrong. And a lot of the differences between the two fields comes to just this extreme iteration speed we have. When we can deploy an entirely new version of our app in just a few seconds, that opens up entirely new techniques for defect fixing and iteration. The other two um, differences that I noticed are a little bit less obvious, though. The first is this notion of constraint. As one of my heroes, Nancy Levison, put it, in software, we no longer have to worry about the physical realization of our designs, but we also no longer have physical laws that limit the complexity of our designs. Think again of the tower, which was just four inches too small for the device sensor. They couldn't fit it in the floor. And this actually has some really interesting consequences to how people do engineering. A third electrical engineer I talked to was working on CPUs. And the CPU was broken to multiple subcomponents, each run by different teams. Additionally, each team had a set of constraints on area, thermal usage of their part, the number of clock cycles they could use, things like that. There was also global constraints in the whole chip. And what very quickly happens is that there became a sort of market between all the teams. Like, one team would realize, hey, we could optimize things that we use a little bit less area. Then we can sell that area to the adjacent team, and in return, they'll sell some of their, their um, thermal budget. They're not using as much heat as they need, and we are trying to use a bit more heat than we need. So we give them our area, they give us their heat budget. The third difference, and I think one of the most interesting ones, is this notion of consistency. Software is just so much more consistent in how it behaves than reality. Like, take this quasi quick sort in Python. This will run the same whether you're on a Windows machine, like mine, a Mac, like I'm sure all of you have. It'll run equally well on an AMD um, CPU, an Apple M1 chip, and an Intel like i9. In contrast, this over here is a um, spec sheet for a capacitor. Can everybody read this? No? OK, let me just put it on the board. So a couple things I want to point out here. For this series, Operational temperature range is negative 40 to 105 degrees centigrade. Voltage range, 4 to 63 volts. Capacitance range is 0.1 to 1,000 microfarads. A farad is the unique capacitance used in electrical engineering. And finally, this capacitance tolerance is plus or minus 20% at 120 hertz and 20 degrees centigrade. That means that in standard operating conditions, your 500 microfarad capacitor it could be 400 farads, could be 600 farads. You have no idea. It could change from day to day. And this has a lot of consequence on people engineer things. A mechanical engineer I interviewed said that this actually changed their product flow. They had a lot of different suppliers for their parts for this exact reason. They would come up with some idea of a part and write a spec for that part. Then they would ship that spec off to three separate suppliers and see how their factories manufactured that part according to their spec. Because even though they all followed the spec, they all had subtle differences not covered by the spec or inside the tolerances. And then they'd see which of these actually closely matched what they need and go with that supplier for that part. Basically, it's kind of like if they tried four libraries at once and then went with which one um, went best for the spike. I definitely done that. How many of you have done that? Yeah. So there are now, we can see, some differences. Software is rapid when traditional is much slower. Software is consistent where the traditional is inconsistent, and software is not nearly as constrained. But do these differences make us special? Yes, software does things differently from mechanical and civil. But chemical also does some things differently than mechanical and civil. So does electrical. Mechanical does something different, different things than civil, which is different from industrial. All these fields have their own unique problems that they and only they have to deal with. 
But all of us, including software engineering, share much more in common about our approaches, our practices, our philosophies than we have separate. So no, we are not special. And this is a good thing. Because software engineering is one of the youngest fields of engineering. And unlike other recent fields, like, like nuclear and aerospace, it doesn't have a grounding in an older field, like civil or mechanical. So there's a lot of lessons we've been having to learn the hard way. And if we could learn these lessons from these other fields, this would help advance us quite a bit. But this also goes both ways, because there's some things that we do much, much better than any other field that we can contribute back. As to what we as software people can learn, some of it's kind of boring high-level stuff, like upfront planning time is really good. As they say, weeks of development can save a few hours of planning. And it helps to have more responsibility to your end users. As for something specific, I think one of the most interesting things I learned about is highly domain-specific teaching material. One mechanical engineer listed two of their favorite books in engineering, one software, one traditional. Their favorite software book was The Design of Everyday Things. Have any of you read it? Yeah, great book. But their most useful traditional engineering book was the first snap fit handbook. I apologize for not having a physical copy of the book. Um, the library didn't have it, and it costs $200 on Amazon. <laughs> for those of you who don't know, this is a snap fit. The thing that little clicks on your remote that it together, and this was a whole book about how to engineer them, how to design them, all of that. At least according to him, again, I didn't read it. There's nothing really like this in software. Like, sure, there is exist materials for like tools, like Docker, but when was the last time you, you found a resource that was just all about, here's how to design a plugin system for your application, or here's all of the best practices and all the comparative studies on how to do API versioning. I think if we made these resources, we, it would really, really help us in software. Not necessarily because it's going to give us the best practice, but it'll give us a point of comparison between all the different approaches people have tried and the relative trade-offs they saw. Now, that's some of the things that we can learn. As for what we can teach, I found that part a lot more interesting. Oh, yeah. Because while I sort of had to sort of piece together what we can learn from like a lot of different people, what they said we could teach was actually really, really consistent across everybody I talked to. The first thing, we're pretty much the only field of engineering that has practitioner-oriented conferences. Everybody else has academic conferences where they talk about research, and they have vendor conferences where people try to sell them products, but they don't really have the spaces where all of us get together and just talk about how to do our jobs better. And they also don't have the same cross-discipline discussions. One of the chemical engineers, after I finished asked, talking to her, asked me this question, what did other chemical engineers say about their work? Because the only people she had contact with were the other people at her old job. She never really talked to any other chemical engineers in her profession outside of that. Whereas before I started doing formal methods, I was a web dev. There's just so much more ability for us to cross boundaries in software engineering, and that's a good thing. This is also, incidentally, why there's so many self-taught software engineers out there. Not everybody at home has an oscilloscope, but everybody has a computer. And we've just produced so much self-teaching material that it is possible, unlike those other fields, to learn software engineering at your own home. But even that's not the biggest thing we can give back. The biggest thing shocked me because it was something that every single person I talked to brought up. Think about that for a second. Try to guess it. <laughs> Every single person I talked to brought version control. Some kinds of version control exists in other fields, like it's called change management processes. But compared to what we have with Git or Fossil, everybody else is basically doing file.final.final2.zip.final3. <laughs> Nobody else has the ability to bisect and find the exact commit where something, where a test fails, or to find the commits where certain lines and certain terms were removed from the code base, and who did them and why as part of which branches. Nobody else has the concept of continuous integration, 
where they can, why is this animation still going? Yeah, it has the concept of continuous animation where, continuous integration where they can just take their system and put it up, up um, in like the cloud and run all sorts of tests on it automatically and get automatic approval or rejection based on that. If the only thing that software engineering contributes back to any of their field is just really good version control, we would have changed their lives. So, to wrap up, yes, engineers. No, we're not special. And there's a lot we can both teach and learn from other fields. If you're interested in this, if you're interested in this, um, this isn't the only thing I produce based on this. I also have a series of three-part essays, one for each of these questions, at my site. I also will use a completely different set of examples, like, for example, why um, oil rigs are the biggest um, purchaser of empty hazelnut shells in Norway. So yeah, if you're interested in this, I'd recommend reading that, 10,000 words across three essays. I also plan to have a um, page for, the, for this um, talk where I would list all of my references and like do attributions for all my images and stuff like that. That's unfortunately not up yet. I, I do have to disclose though that none of these has the transcripts and I will not be putting the transcripts online. I promised every person I talked to that their conversations would be totally private. I would only summarize them. But if that's something disappointing to you, why not interview people yourself? Because that's what I really want to end on. This was easy. I just had read all these arguments about people discussing them and I thought, I want to talk to some people. And I just asked and people were happy to talk to me. There's a lot of stuff I didn't cover and didn't really even ask about because I focused on what I cared about. If you want to learn more about the actual techniques, what meetings look like in other fields, the certification process, anything, and you feel like I didn't cover stuff, I'd recommend doing this kind of work yourself. It's not that hard to do and you learn just so much by talking to other people about their experiences. So that's really what I'd like to lead on. What I did, our work is not special, but this work I did for this talk wasn't special either. You can do it too and I'd really strongly recommend it. Thank you.